Well, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts always be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So twice in the last week, I have found myself in a fast food restaurant. I normally try to completely avoid eating fast food, but in both of these cases, I was in a hurry. At one point, I was picking up Claire from camp. She hadn't eaten. McDonald's was the only option. I know. <laughs> Now, it's been so long that I've been in a fast food restaurant that I haven't been in a fast food restaurant that I hadn't even realized that the way you order has changed. So it's more like Wawa now where there is a screen and you go up and you, you type what you want to eat. So at the McDonald's, there was sort of a, a mix of responses to that new ordering system. Some people went right to the touch screen but a bunch more waited in line for the one and only cashier that was available. <laughs> so as we stood around waiting for our food, one customer grumbled about the new system. McDonald's is, they're just trying to get out of paying the new minimum wage by laying off workers and replacing them with computer screens. And then somebody else chimed in about how the service had gone downhill. And I stood there and I watched as employees frantically scrambled, trying to put their orders together. They were working hard, but it was, it was definitely understaffed. And it also just seemed like everyone wanted to get in and get out as quickly as possible. Nobody was particularly happy about their fast food meal. And it's like we had taken the concept of a meal, of, of sustenance, and broken it down to its least attractive possibility, a grumpy crowd waiting for a flattened hamburger. So what are, what are some of the meals that you eat in your week? Do you eat fast food on the go or, or meals with family? Is there somebody at work you like to eat with? Those are all different settings with different expectations. Maybe expectations that we carry about our relationship with those who we're eating with. And then what about this meal? The meal that we're about to celebrate around the altar. Because when you think of the meals that you have during your week, where does communion fit in for you? What does the Eucharist even mean in the context of all of those other meals? What does it mean in the context of other members of, of this body who are coming together here as the church to share it with you? Well, Jesus' teachings on communion are definitely central to today's gospel, and Jesus uses some pretty memorable images today as well. He describes himself as living bread, and he presents a pretty visceral description of, of what that looks like. His very flesh is the bread that we're called to eat. So how do you think the listeners of this early chapter of John understood those words? Eating flesh and drinking blood. They had no reference, they had no basis, no understanding of communion in which to encounter those words. And so it's probably not surprising that early Christians were called cannibals for passages like this, for, for the Eucharist. But we know that this passage isn't about cannibalism. Living bread is about the all-encompassing, life-changing reality of the Eucharist, both the sacrament and how we're transformed by it. It's about a God who would offer up his own flesh to be in relationship with us, and because of that love for us, it's also about a way of being, which includes and, and even transcends the actual ritual itself. So how does the living bread that Jesus speaks about, how does that change the way you encounter the world? A favorite seminary professor of mine used to always talk about the Eucharist with a simple description. I know I've said it before in sermons, 
He'd say without this meal, the Eucharist, none of those other meals that you have during your week matter. And without those other meals, the ones outside the door of the church, this meal doesn't matter. So what do you hear in that? See, for me, it makes me think of a God who is challenging us to be spiritually authentic outside of the doors of the church, just like we are at the communion table. So I wonder even, like, how could I have been spiritually authentic waiting at the McDonald's or the other, the Wendy's I was at also earlier in this week? What would Jesus have seen in that mixture of people and experiences in those two places? What would Jesus have seen in the justice issues for the workers? If there's one reality about Jesus's ministry, it's that he always seems to understand the deeper complexity of his neighbor's lives. So I think that's what the Eucharistic life is about, seeing deeper and living more authentically in every part of your life. Whether it's that unexpected meal at McDonald's or or the meal that we will share around the altar. We can't have one without the other. We can't be spiritually authentic at the altar, but not in our daily lives. And we also can't be authentic in our daily lives, but hold back from a deeper relationship with God at the altar. The reality is that Jesus wants us to consecrate all of our lives, all for him, just as we consecrate the bread and the wine at the altar. We're each part of the living bread. Now, if Jesus wants us to be authentic in today's gospel reading, in all that we do to, to carry the Eucharist with us, Paul wants us to be on guard. So what are some of the realities that you're on guard about in life? You know, we just went away for vacation about a week ago. Often we turn off the water because we're on guard about a leak. Or maybe we buy insurance for things that we want to be on guard for in our lives. Well, today, Paul wants us to know that we need to be on guard for what might take us away from the Eucharistic life. In fact, he makes a bold statement. You might not have caught it. He starts by saying, the days are evil. That's why we need to be on guard. There are lots of opportunities for any one of us to come off the rails. And Paul is warning us about what behaviors make it difficult for us to maintain the Eucharistic life. And today he uses one example, drunkenness, but I'll bet we could all very quickly name behaviors which make it difficult to abide in the Eucharistic life. What about broken relationships that we choose not to heal or repair? What about judging entire groups of people? What about only looking out for number one? See, what Paul is really getting at is that we are called to make all of our lives holy, no exceptions. And that goes for the good days and easy people that we encounter. And it especially goes for our grumpiest days in dealing with the people in the situations that are difficult. I can tell you today what those difficult, I can't tell you today what those difficult parts of your life are. In life, we each have our own uniquely calibrated challenges. But what I can tell you this Sunday is that we again come together around this table to feast. We come together to remember the gift of a God who would die for us, even though none of us deserved it. Flesh and blood given for you a feast that you carry outside of those doors. And we come together to remember the grace of eternal life and our invitation to walk more closely through this meal all week long. So today you are invited to enter more deeply into the living bread, the living bread of God consecrated for you. Let us pray. May you feel the love of a God who shed blood and died for you. May that love give you the hope and strength to carry that love to others when that act is easy and especially when it's hard. And may this meal, 
be the meal which empowers all others during the week. Amen.